Hello everyone. Welcome to the first episode of the Haunted Book Club podcast. My name's Goose. My co-host is Bean. Bean will tell you the daily joke to make sure you smile at least once today. Because happiness looks good on you. What's up, Buttercup? I've got a joke for you. What do you call an old ghost? A boom Our first story today is The Telltale Heart by Edgar Allan Poe. It's true, yes, I have been ill, very ill. But why do you say that I've lost control of my mind? Why do you say that I'm mad? Can you not see I have full control of my mind? Is it not clear that I'm not mad? Indeed, the illness only made my mind, my feelings, my senses stronger, more powerful. My sense of hearing especially became more powerful. I could hear sounds I had never heard before. I heard sounds from heaven, and I had heard sounds from hell. Listen, listen, and I will tell you how it happened. You will see. You will hear how healthy my mind is. It is impossible to say how the idea first entered my head. There was no reason for what I did. I did not hate the old man. I even loved him. He had never hurt me. I did not want his money. I think it was his eye. His eye was like the eye of a vulture. The eye of one of those terrible birds that watch and wait while an animal dies. And then fall upon the dead body and pull it to pieces to eat it. When the old man looked at me with his vulture eye, a cold feeling went up and down my back. Even my blood became cold. And so I finally decided I had to kill that man and close that eye forever. So you think that I'm mad? Madman cannot plan. You should have seen me. During all of that week, I was as friendly to the old man as I could be, as warm and loving. Every night, about 12 o'clock, I would slowly open his door. And when the door was opened wide enough, I would put my hand in, and then my head. And in my hand, I held a light covered with a cloth, so no light showed. And I stood there quietly. Then carefully, I lifted the cloth just a little, so that a single, thin, small light fell across that eye. For seven nights, I did this. Seven long nights. Every night at midnight, always the eye was closed, so it was impossible for me to do the work. For it was not the old man I felt I had to kill. It was the eye, his evil eye. And every morning, I went to his room with a warm, friendly voice. I asked him how he had slept. He could not guess that every night, at just twelve, I looked at him as he slept. The eighth night, I was more than usually careful. I opened the door. The hands on the clock moved more quickly than I did my hand. Never before had I felt so strongly my power. I was now sure of success. The old man was lying there, not dreaming that I was at his door. Suddenly, he moved in his bed. You may think I became afraid, but no. The darkness in the room was thick and black. I knew he could not see the opening of the door. I continued to push the door, slowly, softly. I put in my head. I put in my hand with the covered light. Suddenly, 
the old man sat straight up in bed and cried, Who's there? I stood quite still. For a whole hour, I did not move. Nor did I hear him lie down in his bed. He just sat there, listening. Then I heard a sound, a low cry of fear, which escaped the old man. Now I knew he was sitting in bed, filled with fear. I knew he knew that I was there. He did not see me there. He could not hear me there. He felt me. Now he knew that death was standing there. Slowly, little by little, I lifted my cloth until a small, small light escaped to fall upon that vulture eye. It was open, wide, wide open. My anger increased as it looked straight at me. I could not see the old man's face, only that eye, that hard blue eye. And the blood in my body became like ice. Have I not told you that my hearing had become unusually strong? Now I could hear a quick, soft sound, like the sound of a clock heard through a wall. It was the beating of the old man's heart. I tried to stand quietly. But the sound grew louder. The old man's fear must have been great indeed. And as the sound grew louder, my anger became greater and more painful. It was more than anger. In the quiet night, in the dark silence of the bedroom, my anger became fear, for the heart was beating so loudly that I was sure someone must hear. The time had come. I rushed into the room crying, Die! Die! The old man gave loud cries of fear as I fell upon him and held the bed covers tightly over his head. Still his heart was beating, but I smiled as I felt success was near. For many minutes that heart continued to beat, but at last the beating stopped. The old man was dead. I took away the bed covers and held my ear to his heart. There was no sound. Yes, he was dead, dead as a stone. His eye would trouble me no more. So, I am mad, you say. You should have seen how careful I was to put the body where no one could find it. First, I cut off the head, then the arms, then the legs. I was careful not to let a single drop of blood fall on the floor. I pulled up three of the boards that formed the floor. As I finished this work, I heard someone was at the door. It was now four o'clock in the morning, but still dark. I had no fear, however. I went down to open the door. Three men were at the door. Three officers of the police. One of the neighbors had heard the old man cry out and had called the police. These three had come to question and search the house. I asked the policemen to come in. The cry, I said was my own, in a dream. The old man, I said, was away. He had gone to visit a friend in the country. I took them through the whole house, telling them to search it all, to search well. I led them finally to the old man's bedroom, as if playing a game with them. I asked him to sit down and talk for a while. My easy, quiet manner made the police believe my story. So they sat there talking to me in a friendly way. But, although I answered them in the same way, I soon wished they would go. My head hurt, and there was a strange sound in my ears. I talked more, faster, 
the sound became clearer, and they still sat and talked. Suddenly, I knew that sound was not in my ears. It was not just inside my head. At that moment, I must have become quite white. I talked still faster and louder. Sound too became louder. It was quick, low, soft sound. Like the sound of a clock being heard through a wall. Sound I knew well. Louder it became, and louder. Why did the men not go? Louder, louder. I stood up and walked away quickly. I pushed the chair across the floor to make more noise, to cover that terrible sound. I talked even louder. And still the men sat there, talked and smiled. Was it possible they could not hear? No, they heard. It was certain. They knew. Now they were the ones playing the game with me. I was suffering more than I could bear. From the smiles and from the sound, louder, louder, louder. Suddenly, I could bear it no longer. I pointed to the boards and cried, Yes, yes, I killed him. Pull up the boards and you shall see. I killed him. But why does his heart not stop beating? Why does it not stop? The end. For our next story, it's a more personal story. Part of this is inspired by what actually happened to me when I switched schools for grade six. The rest of it is what I came up with for what happened afterwards. You figure out where the story switches. Back in 2005, I changed schools for grade six. It was an interesting experience. Made new friends, met back with old ones from scouts and such. My class was invited to check it out. There were regular things you'd expect. Their pet, their favorite toy or baby clothes. One girl brought something I was drawn to before even seeing it. A Ouija board. My friend Ben teased me, saying I should try it, being all psychic. I laughed. Sure, why not? What's the worst that could happen? So I put two fingers on the planchette with the girl who owned it. Slowly, almost mockingly, I said, Hello? Is anyone there? Ben elbowed my ribs, saying, Sorry, it seems to be a bad connection. I laughed until I saw the planchette move to yes. The girl looked at me accusingly. She was gobsmacked. It, it's never done that before. Kid, I call BS, Ben yelled. The teacher took him by the arm out to the hallway for a talking to. When I looked back at the Ouija board, it was making its way to no. Saying nothing, I caught eyes with the girl. And then I moved to the next station. One day, a few days later, I was getting ready for gym class. I noticed the remnants of what I assume was a shoelace. I asked one of my classmates if they knew why it was there. She didn't. That gave me an idea. Later that day, when we went outside for recess, I found Ouija board girl struck up a conversation. Hey, you remember the other day? I started. Yeah, what about it? I think whatever we contacted was in my dream last night. As if, as Ben so plainly put it, that's BS. I even have a way to prove it to you. I'll show you after school. Meet me by the gym. Why not? I have no plans after school. So when the bell rang at the end of the day, Instead of grabbing our stuff, Ben and I dropped our books at our lockers and headed to the gym. It seems she spread word about it because almost half her class was there. When I got there, I rushed everyone into the locker room before we were caught and got in trouble, knocking first to make sure it was empty. Then, like an awkward tour guide, I got everyone's attention, but they were too chattery. Ben got the bright idea to turn off the lights. That works. I thought, as a crowd of a dozen fifth graders screamed. A couple of boys ran for the door. Sorry, boys. Did I f hurt your fragile masculinity? Ben said sarcastically as he turned the lights back on. Now, where's your proof, Miss Cleo? Ouija board girl asked snootily. I started filling everyone in about what happened in their class with the Ouija board. I continued with the dream. I met a little girl around your age in my dream last night. She told me her name is Judith. She was a student here years ago, and she was bullied for being the weird kid. The bullying was so bad, 
She had a breakdown after gym class one day when the bully took all her clothes from her locker. An intense moment. In an intense moment of spiraling negative emotions, she looked at her shoes. She started taking the laces out and used them to hit the escape button of her life. And because of that, now she's stuck haunting the school. Then Ouija board girl said, Nice fairy tale, four eyes. I thought you had proof. I was just getting to that. Is in this bathroom. One of the fifth grade smartasses said, Oh, what? More crap like your crappy story? And let him out of the change room. You are the weakest link. Goodbye. I opened the door and showed the scrap of shoelace that was left cubicle. She also told me before I woke up that the school is named in her honor to appease her spirit. That's why she doesn't bother anyone. It looked like a couple of kids were raised on only Barney and Teletubbies by how scared they looked. Then Ben turned off the lights again, causing all the kids to scream and run for the door to leave. Ben almost got trampled in the process. When the lights turned back on, there was a little girl with curly hair sitting on the floor. That's not right. Ben, don't. It can't be. I grabbed his arm. It's her. What? He looked from me back to the girl. She slowly raised her head. Her hair covered most of her face in shadows, like an evil version of a kid's smile on Christmas morning. Ben and I booked it out there, half terrified, half tinkled pink by what we had just seen. I thought you were BSing about the ghost girl. How did you know she'd appear? Ben, you were right. I was BSing. I made it all up. Ben fell over as we turned the corner. What? What the heck? What's that back there? I shrugged my shoulders as we continued running. When we got out to the sidewalk, we took a moment to catch our breath. You both look like you've seen a ghost. We both screamed. It's just, it's just Mr. Buchanan. Best lie I could come up with in the moment. Running in the holes, eh? You can't be doing that after school after I mop up. You might hit a wet spot and hurt yourselves. You're right. We have to get going now. Have a good evening, sir. We turned and started to walk away. Oi, where are your books then? We both laughed and then went and got our stuff. That was a Friday. So thankfully, we had a couple days to figure out what we should do next. If it had happened a few short months later, I might have tried something the Winchesters did on Supernatural. Probably would have burnt down the school. At least it would have been well seasoned. Thankfully... I only had a couple of books on spooky things that I got at book fairs or through Scholastics, but nothing came from my evening of looking before bed. I called Ben to say we should go to the library. Maybe they'll have something about her death in the archives. So that's what we did, bright and early, early for a 12-year-old. We got there by 11. Ben was waiting by the entrance. Hey, have you been waiting long? I asked. Nah, my dad dropped me off at like 9 on his way to do groceries. Ben shrugged. That's nice, I guess. Did you find anything? Nah, I was just waiting for you. Uh, I wouldn't even know where to start. So, we spent three hours looking up history of the school, local deaths, especially named Judith. I think we worried one of the librarians. We had to tell her repeatedly it was for a history project. After finding many older Judiths, finally, Ben, check this out. Judith Buchanan was found dead in the girls' change room of her elementary school. April 14th, 1994. Ben grabbed my chair and spun me so we were face to face. Jamie! Her last name is Buchanan? Maybe that means she's a custodian's kid. Calm down there, dude. I didn't read that far. I said laughing as I spun myself back and continued reading. Judith's family is asking for privacy while they deal with this terrible loss. Service will be held on the 23rd. Darn, that didn't help much. Ben suggested we look for an obituary. He may or may not have called it an orbit. Got it. After looking through a few weeks' newspapers on microfish, Judith Buchanan, daughter of Daryl and Stacy Buchanan. Is that him? Daryl? I don't know. I only know him as Mr. Buchanan. I'm new, remember? Well, that makes two of us, son. I only came here just after Christmas. Star. We continued to dig through the archives. Eventually, we stumbled upon a yearbook from the early 90s. There she was. Small picture with the name Judith Buchanan underneath. 
Hey, Ben, look, it's her. Ben squinted. I didn't know elementary schools had yearbooks back then. It's definitely the same girl we saw in the locker room. Creepy. We decided to photocopy the relevant pages and headed to the librarian's desk. The librarian, Mrs. Malcolm, eyed us suspiciously, but agreed. As the machine whirled, Ben whispered, This is like a Scooby-Doo mystery, solving the case of the ghost girl. Jinkies, I giggled as I pretended to fling my hair over my shoulder. We tried to stifle our laughter, but it was made even harder by the fact that we caught eyes with Mrs. Malcolm. I grabbed my papers and put them in my bag, plopped the books and the film we used to the return shelf, and we left. I'll see you at school on Monday. We'll talk to him. I figure that if anyone can help Judith find peace, it would be her father, I said as I hugged him. Assuming it is him, Ben shrugged, walking off home. As the weekend came to an end, I found myself with a mix of fascination and trepidation. Finding Mr. Buchanan was more challenging than we anticipated. Discreetly asking around, eventually a teacher pointed us in the right direction. We found him in the janitorial services room. Um, Mr. Buchanan? I stammered. He turned around, looking like he could use some more coffee. Ben and I exchanged nervous glances before I took a deep breath. We, um, found something interesting in the archive. Are you by chance related to this girl? Mr. Buchanan's expression changed to a mix of sadness and curiosity. Judith, why do you want to know? Well, I know it sounds like something from the X-Files, sir, but uh, last week I think we made contact with her. I wanted to continue, but the look of rage took the words from me. Um, this is a very inappropriate joke for you kids to be pulling. I fumbled with my words for a minute. I just took a deep breath and told him the whole story of what happened. I know it isn't something to joke about. I just want to help Judith find peace. Gowl on his face faded into a look of utter despair. I never knew why she did it. It's been a painful mystery all these years, he admitted tearfully. After a moment of silence, he thanked us for bringing the information to him. We accompanied him to the change room. It was an emotional moment for him. Standing in the space where his daughter met her tragic end, we could feel a heavy and cathartic energy in the air. Judas, sweetie, are you there? It's daddy. I thought you were still here. The tragedy and trauma is from your death. Left a palpable mark on the school. That's why I started working here. Be close to you. Ben and I gasped. Judas appeared the same as she had on Friday. Mr. Buchanan fell to his knees in a sobbing heap, arms outstretched to embrace the little girl he hadn't seen in more than a decade, Judas said, without moving her mouth. She moved towards her father. He cradled Judith for a long time. Then she started to glow and then faded away. Mr. Buchanan remained on his knees, looking both grateful and heartbroken. He wiped away his tears, gazing at the empty space where Judith had been just moments before. Thank you, he whispered. His voice, his voice filled with a mix of sorrow and relief. I never thought I'd have the chance to hold her again. Ben and I stood there, not knowing what to say. In a moment so powerful and personal, words were inadequate. After a moment, weight lifted from his shoulders. As we left the change room, the atmosphere felt different. It was as if a heavy aura that had lingered for years dissipated. The school seemed brighter, and the air felt lighter. The story of Judith's ghost became a local legend. It now carried a message of compassion and understanding. The school started anti-bullying initiatives. The students and teachers alike became more conscious of creating supportive and inclusive environment. Our unintentional journey into the paranormal had not only resolved the lingering spirits and rest, but it also transformed our school into a more compassionate and connected community. Except Ben. He made sure her story carried on. When his little brother went to the school a few years later, Ben brought his brother and some friends into the change room and told them the story. Then he shut off the lights one of the friends ended up fainting. 
Well, I hope you enjoyed our stories for today. This is the end of this episode. I hope you enjoyed our stories for today. Join us next time. And if you have a story, real, fictional, public domain, that you'd like me to tell, send me an email at haunted.bookclub.podcast at gmail.com. Have a good night. Till next time.